Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in. It is the Wednesday, May 26th podcast. Recording on Tuesday, May 25th. I am your host, Gary Seegers. Riding solo this evening. Chris knocked his out on Sunday night. And I swapped with him, so I am taking over the Tuesday night duties. Hopefully everybody is doing well uh, this evening slash morning, whenever you are watching or listening to this. I hope that you're all having a good week so far. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and give you the rundown. We're going to talk some NFL. We, Of course, Aaron Rodgers, we got to hit on that. we got to talk about Jalen Smith from the Cowboys and what's happening with him. I'm going to tell you about my son at gymnastics a little bit. Uh, Jake Paul, I mean, we're, we're going to talk a lot of combat sports this evening uh, towards the end of the show, but Jake Paul, George St. Pierre, Oscar De La Hoya, uh, Mayweather, like all this different stuff that's going on, we're going to hit on that. We typically don't on our live shows because, hey, we, we hit on football, but tonight, my show, we are going to discuss this stuff. So before we do that, as always... WinningCuresEverything.com is the website. If you would, do us a favor. Go and visit over there. Everything that you need to know about us, you can find at that site. Every appearance that we make, every show that we do, gets posted right there. Easy to find. One simple place. That's the spot. WinningCuresEverything.com. Of course, if you have not already subscribed at all of these different places, do us a favor. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Periscope, Twitch, whatever, the the podcast, whatever your favorite podcast app is. We are going to be there. You can find our stuff everywhere. It's easy to access. Do us a favor and subscribe. And on the podcast, of course, with Apple Podcasts, leave a nice five-star review. That would certainly help us out. And, uh, and on YouTube, like the video, share it out, tell a friend, all that good stuff. We would appreciate you knocking that out. So with that said, let's, uh, let's go ahead and hit on the topics at hand for the evening. Oh, yeah, by the way, sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. We do a college football show every single week. Comes out on Wednesday. Go and check it out. You can search for it on YouTube, SBR Picks. That is the easiest spot to do it. Uh, but sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF is your one-stop shop for all your college football gambling content. Into the show we go. Let's start off with Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers. He was on with Kenny Main for his last appearance on SportsCenter, and it was entertaining. Uh, obviously, if you have already seen it, you know about the end of the interview where Kenny Main talked about, hey, you told me to go big on cryptocurrency. That's down 40%. Then I lost my job. Basically, F you, Aaron Rodgers. And it was fantastic. It was super entertaining. I love seeing it. But he did give us some insight into what's been going on with his rift with the Packers organization. And this is the most that we've heard him talk about it ever since all that stuff hit on draft night. I mean, that was back at uh, about a month ago. It was on the first night of the NFL draft when Adam Schefter decided to drop all of his quote-unquote intel. I don't know how much of that was true or how much it was told to him by other sources, whatever. He felt good enough about it to run with a story. But there wasn't anything that broke on that day. So we're not going to get into the Schefter stuff. But we will talk about what Aaron Rodgers said about the Packers' rift as of right now. He said, with my situation, looks like, uh, look, I've never been about the draft pick picking Jordan. Uh, he said, I love Jordan. He's a great kid. A lot of fun to work together. Love the coaching staff. Love my teammates. Love the fan base in Green Bay. An incredible 16 years. It's just kind of about a philosophy and maybe forgetting that it is about the people that make the thing go. It's about character. It's about culture. It's about doing things the right way. So there have been all kinds of stories that have come out about Rodgers wanting to be involved in some of the decision-making. And there are other, there's other organizations that involve their star quarterbacks in these decisions, right? Uh, the Bucks called Tom Brady. Talked to him to make sure that he was okay with them taking Kyle Trask in the second round of this NFL draft. Last year, Patrick Mahomes, they actually called him. Andy Reid and the GM, they had kind of decided who they wanted to take. They hit up Mahomes in the first round said, hey, what are you thinking for this first pick in the NFL draft? They made their quarterbacks feel included in the decision process. And I think that's smart. You get them on your side. 
you don't allow a rift the same way that Deshaun Watson, Aaron Rodgers, et cetera, you don't allow that to happen because once it infiltrates the locker room, it's going to split the locker room between guys that are siding with the guy that they know can win and guys that are siding with the team that pays them. You're almost, if you feel like you are going to have a job in this league no matter what, you're almost always going to side with the guy that's been in the locker room with you. That's just the way it goes. Rogers coming out and talking about this. Uh, there's been a couple of stories about he, you know, went in and wanted to talk to him about the direction of the team, about the philosophy of the team, et cetera. And they basically told him, hey, uh, why don't you just go downstairs, hang out with your boys in the locker room, and, and we'll handle this. And I don't think that that's a smart way to go about business. Now, it, it is a way to go about it. Not everybody is uh, deserving of the right to be able to be a part of that process. You know, it, not everybody on the team can do that. I do think Aaron Rodgers is one of those guys, along with Tom Brady, along with Patrick Mahomes, along with et cetera, et cetera. Like, there's, there's several here. Peyton Manning, he was a part of that stuff. I think Aaron Rodgers has earned that right after 16 years in Green Bay. Maybe I'm mistaken, but that's the way that I feel about it. And him coming out and actually saying this, it's about philosophy, maybe forgetting that it's about the people that make the thing go. That's, uh, I mean, that says a lot. I don't know. Like, this is not a guy that lets go of grudges. We know that. We've said it on the show multiple times. But he is irritated right now, and I don't know how they're going to fix this. I just, I have no idea. So I'm curious to see what comes out next, but the Kenny Mayne interview was incredibly entertaining. If you haven't watched it, go and do it. Next up, we're going to stay in the NFL. And we're going to talk about Cowboys linebacker Jalen Smith. He is switching his number from number 54 over to number 9. And this is what this is what he ended up saying. Uh, he, he had to buy out the current inventory of the number 54 jerseys and T-shirts. It's, it's NFL rule is what it is. Uh, he said that it, well, if, if the number had changed in 2022, he wouldn't owe any money. But because he's doing it right now, it's going to cost him uh, mid six figures. I mean, we're talking a lot of money. And he said it's about value over cost. Definitely a blessing being able to play for the Cowboys. So working out the terms the right way, really I'm just thankful to be in the number nine and have an opportunity to turn this thing around this year. We're all here focused, we're locked in, and we know what we need to accomplish. He, uh, he got the blessing from Jerry Jones, and he came out and said, first and foremost, it's a blessing and an honor to be able to carry on the nine legacy. Tony Romo did an amazing job of just being elite and putting together great success for the Cowboys franchise. As you know, new players coming in, always getting an opportunity to sometimes carry on legacy. That's the opportunity that the Jones family granted me in wearing number nine, so it's definitely a blessing. It's been a part of my life. I've been wearing number nine since I was nine years old through peewee, middle school, high school, college, all-American games, you name it. Number nine is a part of me. It's really just a blessing to be able to continue the legacy. So the we haven't talked about this much, but the NFL changed its number policy this offseason. They're allowing linebackers to wear anywhere from number one through 59 and then 90 through 99. Uh, Smith has worn number nine forever. He wore it at Notre Dame. He wore it in high school. I mean, it, exactly what he was talking about. But I I do wonder about the value. I think that this is a mental thing, which could be good for Jalen Smith. He's been pretty good with the Cowboys. Obviously, he was coming off of an injury when he left Notre Dame and came into the league because he was expected to be a high, high, maybe top 10 pick and tore his ACL in the bowl game against Ohio State. So that put a damper on things. Didn't exactly get drafted where he wanted to get drafted, but I get it. So coming in and getting his old number back, I think that the value of that, because my, my first thought was, this is ridiculous. Why would you pay that much when you could just get the number the next year for free? Like, why would you, what is the value there? How, who, who knows you know, obviously, if somebody else gets it, you're going to have to talk to them and, and discuss swapping at that point. But going ahead and getting the number, I think, is all mental. You know, it, we sometimes overlook the mental aspect of these games and the numbers and the, you know, everything else that goes into it. The things that make these guys the most comfortable. I, I couldn't imagine that a number would bother me that bad. 
But if he's worn number nine his entire life and then all of a sudden he had to swap to 54, I could see where that would be an issue. Just a little bit. It wouldn't be an issue for me because I don't know. I'm, I'm superstitious, but I'm not superstitious in that way. If he is incredibly superstitious and that number has had an effect on his play, and he's still been pretty good. Like, don't get me wrong. But if he can take it to another level just by swapping his number, get his his mind correct, and, and when things go wrong, he doesn't have that crutch anymore of, it's because I'm having to wear this damn 54. Like, maybe it is worth it. It, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me, but in the same respect, it kind of does. So, I, smart for him. Go ahead, knock it out. You know, do your thing, man. It's uh, it's weird that this is a story, but I did find it intriguing. You know, it's it's not your typical, not your typical story. So we will see what ends up going on with that. I'm going to tell you guys about my three year old. His name is Lincoln, and he is in a gymnastics class. I had to take him to gymnastics today. So I've been back at work. I've been complaining about it on the show multiple times. It has been insanely busy, right? So today was my wife's last day at her teaching job for the next however many months uh, until school starts back in the fall. And so she was out doing her thing. I took the boy to gymnastics. We put him in gymnastics because he's three. He is a ball of energy, all the time. He bounces off the walls. I mean, he's absolutely insane. And we thought it would be a good way, you know, on a Tuesday night, go out and get some of that energy out, you know, whatever. And this child, I have taken him to gymnastics one time. It was not an issue when I did it a couple months ago, a month ago, whatever it was. This time, because I have not been there in, I don't even know how long at this point, a month, I guess, five weeks, whatever. Because I had not been there in so long, this child was off the rails. I don't know how to get a toddler back into paying attention to who he's supposed to be paying attention to. He's got coaches that are there, and it's these two teenage girls that are uh, obviously gymnasts, but his entire class is nothing but girls and him. The class that he was in before, before he moved up a level uh, because he was too advanced for the smaller class. Like, now he's one of the younger guys. He was one of the... He was about middle of the pack in the other one. Now he's one of the youngest. And I don't know how to do this. If you have any tips or tricks or whatever, hit me up on Twitter. I'm at GaryWCE. And and jump into the comments. I want to know what you do to get a three-year-old to listen. I don't know that it's even possible. I don't think it's a real thing. But at at multiple points tonight, he was not doing what everybody else was doing, was turning around, putting on a show for me. At at one point, all of the other kids were doing their stretches and all that stuff that the coaches were telling them to do. They were showing them how to do it, etc. And this dude was on his hands and knees, turned around, looking at me, barking like a dog. And I don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to do that. So, you know, I, you can do the, the typical, like, hey, you know, we're going to leave if you don't get this thing in line, whatever. But, uh, but none of that really worked. The only thing that worked was him not being able to see me at certain points. So if any of you are parents out there and you know how to wrangle a toddler, I would appreciate it. Hit me up on Twitter. I'm at GaryWCE. Moving on from that, let's talk some combat sports to close out the show, we got three different topics that we're going to hit. Jake Paul, who I have kind of joked about here and there on the show in the past, over the past however many months, he has created quite a bit of hype for himself. He has signed a multi-fight deal with Showtime. I'm curious how this is going to work. He was in his element with Triller, right? It was a spectacle. It was a joke. It was a carnival, a circus, a three-ring circus. It was rappers and singers over here, and you're not really fighting, you know, real guys, real boxers. Like, you're just putting on a show. Everybody knows you're going to win, and, you know, it is what it is. 
you know, and you can make a ton of money doing that. But his contract ended with Triller, and I am assuming since he signed with Showtime that he is wanting to be respected as a real boxer because nobody really believes that he can beat actual trained boxers right now. Like, I, I, I would he's big enough to. I just don't know that he's trained enough to be able to do that. Now, we will, we will be proven one way or the other if he actually fights somebody. What I'm curious about, though, is Showtime Boxing has had big-time names in the past. Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather, like they've done a bunch of pay-per-views, all this good stuff, right? Are they okay with the way that their boxing stuff is going and just bringing in a name like Jake Paul without all of the circus that surrounds him, is that going to be enough to to get eyeballs on the TV? Is that going to work? That's that's what I'm curious about. I don't know if they are going to stick to what they typically do and make it a real legitimate fight where he fights somebody that actually matters, somebody that's actually done this. Or are they going to look at what Triller did and say, yo, we need to bring in Snoop Dogg, we need to bring in a comedian, we need to bring in all of this different stuff, it's got to be a show, it's got to be stupid, it's got to be da 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 and we can bring in all of his 20 million YouTube followers and get them all to pay 75 bucks for a pay-per-view and, and we'll just make money off of whatever and he'll never actually prove anything. I don't feel like Showtime would do that. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that we actually get to see him fight against somebody real. And the first person on that is Tommy Fury, who is Tyson Fury's half-brother. Uh, Frank Warren is the promoter for him. And this is what Frank Warren said. Uh, he said that da, 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 uh, Triller didn't want the fight, basically. Uh, they are, you know, Jake Paul has swapped broadcasters. And he said, uh, we were talking to Triller about making the fight between Jake Paul and Tommy Fury, but Triller didn't want it. They said maybe in around four or five fights time and all this rubbish, but now Paul has left Triller and gone to Showtime, so we're going to reach out to him and see what we can do. And then he said, Paul apparently was saying that us talking 50-50 in any potential fight was ridiculous, but it wasn't us who called the fight out to begin with. A lot of this YouTube stuff I don't have a lot of time for, but he called us out. It's not like Tommy's unknown either. He's got a few million followers on his social media platforms. He was on Love Island in this country. And obviously, he's Tyson's brother, so he does bring something to the table. So I had to go look this up. I had to go see what was going on. And yeah, Jake Paul called out Tommy Fury, who is 5-0, and a legitimate boxer. like Not super well known in boxing circles as of right now as anything other than uh, the younger brother of heavyweight champion Tyson Fury. But I think this could be a good fight. Apparently, Jake Paul has gone out and, and created fake DMs from Tommy Fury's girlfriend to him or whatever. I mean, it's just just ridiculous. It's all ludicrous. But it is a way to sell a fight. So if they can get that deal done, um, but I do tend to agree with Jake Paul about 50-50 is a little ridiculous. Jake Paul is the one that brings the eyeballs to this. So like any, any 50-50 talk is kind of out the window. So Jake Paul... We are moving on to, that's right, we're going to talk more Triller. Because Triller has lost Jake Paul, they have lost their cash cow, and for them to remain a relevant company, they are going to need some big name fights, right? And they they wanted to actually do real fights. Um, let's see, I cannot remember the guy's name. Uh, Teofima, I think the guy's name is. He is a legitimate champion. He's a fantastic boxer. Oh, Teofimo Lopez. That's it. Sorry. Anyway, Triller knows that, hey, this is a legitimate thing. This gets, this gets us respect. This gets us uh, into places that the circus typically wouldn't. But they don't want to necessarily get away from the circus. And I understand that. They understand that there is a value to having fights like Mike Tyson and Roy Jones Jr., or Tyson and Holyfield, or whatever. Like these old legends getting them together, and there are people out there that will actually pay for these fights. I might be one of them. Just depends on the night. Anyway, neither here nor there. They are trying to get Oscar De La Hoya against George St. Pierre. A couple of months ago, 
we talked on this show about how much of a mockery Triller was making of combat sports. And Dana White agreed with it. Dana White said it is a joke. This is ridiculous. And on top of that, Dana White hates Oscar De La Hoya. There is no way that he would clear George St. Pierre to fight on a card for Triller against Oscar De La Hoya. There's no chance because GSP is a UFC legend. He is absolutely king of the hill, Mount Rushmore. Like, he can do no wrong in Dana White ties, I believe. But the other side of me is looking at this going, would he clear GSP believing that GSP can knock out De La Hoya because he hates De La Hoya? He always talks about him being coked out and all this. Like, I, I, could, I could maybe see that, but... The way that Triller is going about this, Ryan Cavanaugh is is the president or the CEO of the company's name, and he said that they are going to put up $1 million to charity, to the charity of Dana White's uh, choosing if he decides to allow the fight to go on, if he clears the fight for George St. Pierre against Oscar De La Hoya. And I had to laugh because $1 million to Dana White is basically nothing. I mean, it took it took so much more than that. And, and it's not that Dana's not a charitable guy. He's a nice guy. But if you think that's what's going to sell him on this, you have lost your mind. And if you think that trying to put up a million dollars and putting it out into the public is going to sway him one way or the other, then you obviously know nothing about the fight game. This Triller company is, they are making me cackle. At every single turn. I don't know how this company exists. I don't know how they operate. I don't know how they were able to get their startup. Uh, it, it had to be a guy that just had a bunch of money lying around that just wanted to, to make some ridiculous fights that people didn't know if they would care about seeing. But obviously, there is a big enough foundation for it. I just, I, I, don't, I don't know how it's going to continue. I have no idea. So, but it, a million dollars to charity for Dana White's choosing or whatever, or of Dana White's choosing, Dana White don't give a damn about charity. Like, if he wants to give a million dollars to charity, he's got it. I mean, my God, think about all the money that he's made with UFC. He has built that thing into a monster. So, yeah, and especially now that uh, that WME has, has gone, or the Endeavor Group has gone public, I mean, what are we even talking about? Like, it, this, this money is chump change. This is nothing. This will do nothing to sway his decision. And if it's if it's a PR hit, they're trying to make him look bad for not approving. Oh, what do you, we feel bad for the kids. Wait, brother, if you already got the million dollars, it toss it to the kids anyway. Toss it to whatever charity it is. Like, it, don't bring Dana White into this. And finally, finally, since we're bringing up GSP and whatnot, we'll close out. There was some news about Habib Nurmagomedov. Y'all know I like talking about Habib. He retired at 29-0, and 0, and everybody said that the one fight that he would come back for was GSP. And it turns out that is not the case. Apparently, now Ali Abdelaziz is his manager, and he was on the Hot Boxing Podcast with Mike Tyson and that bunch, and they were going back and forth, and you know, sometimes on these things, uh, managers and whatnot, like they like to talk a lot, and they kind of give out some information, and, and sometimes they're just talking complete shit. Like, they are just uh, making up stuff to make the story sound really good, et cetera, et cetera. But what he said in that story was that Habib uh, got multiple calls over the past couple of weeks. He said, two weeks ago or 10 days ago, Dana White called me. He said, George St. Pierre, he said he'll fight Habib in a non-title fight at 165. And he said, in a way, we've been fight or we've been waiting for George. I like George. He's my friend. I like George. We've been waiting for George for four or five years. I'm coming. I'm not coming. Now, he said, hey, Habib's retired. I'm retired. What about coming back and fighting Habib now? But, you know, Habib got offered $100 million after he was retired to fight Floyd Mayweather, which, really? Like, $100 million? Are we sure about that? I just, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, Habib doesn't, doesn't sell fights the way that Conor McGregor sells fights. Uh, but, man, Floyd, like, I... It may be, I don't put anything past Floyd at this point because he's fighting Logan Paul. 
in a couple of weeks. I mean, what are we talking about? It's just ridiculous. Uh, but he said $100 million. You can ask Floyd. You can ask everybody. Habib said, no, I'm retired. I told my mother I'm retired. I'm going to keep my word to my mother. If my mother told me to fight again, maybe I will. But right now, she told me not to fight. So there are people like this out there that are just completely driven, that are completely different, that are not driven by money, that once they set a principle down, that's it. That's the way it's going to go. I am very curious about all of this stuff. Uh, Abdelaziz indicated if St. Pierre is looking to come back against an all-time great, he should fight UFC welterweight champion Kamara Usman, the Nigerian nightmare. He said George St. Pierre wanted to come back. He wanted someone untouchable, right? The pound-for-pound king right now, the Nigerian nightmare Kamara Usman. That man never lost a fight in the UFC. He never got touched in the UFC. He smashed everybody, right? In a way, if he wants to come back and fight somebody invincible, hey, they're the same weight. Come back. George St. Pierre can come back and fight Usman. I'll be more than happy. The UFC will be more than happy. It'll be a huge fight. Now, I don't think that he's wrong. But I don't think that that fight means anything to George St. Pierre. Like, it, it's going to sound ridiculous, but Usman already has that one next to his name. Now, Usman has not lost in UFC, but he's 19-1. and one. Like, he's got the one next to his name. Part of the allure of fighting Habib Nurmagomedov is that nobody has ever beaten him. Even in the early days when he was still learning, he still dominated everybody. Nobody's beaten Habib, but GSP could have been the one to knock him off, and that helps cement a legacy. You come back against somebody like, well, not to mention the fact that Habib respects George St. Pierre, and that could maybe play you know, to his uh, benefit a little bit. And we won't dive into breaking down a hypothetical matchup between Habib and George St. Pierre, but if you're George St. Pierre, like, what what do you gain from, I mean, you're going to get a payday, but, I mean, is it worth it that much to you, really? Like, Habib is a worldwide draw. I don't know that Usman is yet. Like, obviously, the two big fights over, um, over Jorge Masvidal, those are big, but he's he's still not liked. He still ain't selling a bunch of pay-per-views. I'd, I'd like to see what his numbers are the next time he fights. So I, I bring up GSP a lot tonight. Uh, the first time that I ever met my wife was actually at a bar at, and all of you know this, she was working at Hooters. I was at Hooters to watch the George St. Pierre Dan Hardy fight back in March of 2010. So GSP will always hold a special place in my heart. So, anytime there's news about GSP, and if you've watched his, his freaking Instagram stuff, he looks so ridiculously in shape. He looks like he is getting ready to come back for a fight. So, everybody has been kind of excited about it, but then, of course, you see him in the Falcon and Winter Soldier, like he's doing a bunch of other acting stuff. Like, cheers to him. He is continuing his career one way or another. He is making money and, and props to it. But he will always hold a special place in my heart. And I'm going to talk about him every chance I get. But the uh, the Nigerian nightmare, Usman, against GSP, I don't think is happening. That don't make sense uh, for anybody involved. Uh, other than Usman, who, you know, you get a chance to take out a legacy, but, you know, it's a guy that hadn't fought since 2017, and he had not fought, you know, for four years before that. So what does that really prove for him? So either way, that is going to wrap up the show for this evening. We certainly appreciate you being a part of it for giving us a listen, all that good stuff. If you want to follow me and reach out, all that good stuff, I'm on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you have not listened to Chris talking about Lefty at the PGA Tour Championship on Sunday, you need to go listen to that podcast. It was really, really good. He uh, His solo podcasts have been really good lately. So do us a favor, go and download that. And if you're not already, hit the subscribe button, leave a nice five-star review. We will uh, We will be reading those on the show. So make sure that you leave those, and we would certainly appreciate you telling somebody about it. So share the show out. Tell your friends. That's the easiest way to do it. We don't have a marketing department. We're just a bunch of dudes sitting around talking sports, basically like we're uh, hanging out at a sports bar. So tell your friends about it, and make sure you're subscribed everywhere you need to subscribe, and that you like the videos, that you uh, leave a nice review, jump in the comments, all that good stuff, and reach out on Twitter. Of course, at GaryWCE, and also you can find the show at Winning Cures. 
I think that's going to do it. Uh, go to winningcureseverything.com, sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. There are links in the description to those, so you don't even have to remember. You can just click on the link. Simple enough. Uh, but that is going to do this for the show. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, all of you tickets cash this week. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.